I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Content marketing is about filling the sales funnel with qualified prospects. We can all agree on that. And we can probably agree that there's more competition for those prospects now than ever. But what if your funnel is clogged with the wrong visitors? You know, the non-customers. Well, today's guest shares over 20 years experience attracting buyers to his sales teams in the enterprise software, SaaS, and technical professional services industries. No easy feats. And he knows how to use story marketing to make sure the right customer shows up at the right time to increase your conversion rates. Joe Caparella joins us on Business of Story, and today we talk about why you must recognize and tap into the dramatic nature of what's actually happening in your sales conversions, the journey your customer is on, you know, what stories they're telling themselves about you at that moment. We're also going to look at the most powerful word in storytelling, and that is why. That's all about the power of why in your story listening, in your storytelling, and in your story selling. And at the end of the show, Joel has a tool for you to make sure you have the proper story alignment in your sales pipeline. So let's explore how to use story marketing to fill your sales funnel with the right folks. Today with Joel Caparella. I've been in the, the technology space, software, SaaS for a majority of my career, also in the professional services end. I've been on my own for about two years, give or take, helping people tap into what their story's all about. And the background, I, I, I spent some time in product management and guiding the development of product management, and then eventually into product marketing and industry marketing and how we enable large sales forces to penetrate deeply within whatever sector their territory has rich accounts for, right? Did it for the likes of like SAP and, and Oracle, those types of companies. And one of the things that was always consistent was that if I can dramatically connect with the emotional importance of the things that matter to the people that I'm selling to, not in a shilly sort of way, but an honest to goodness, make a difference in their lives sort of way, that the path to not necessarily an easy sale, but a less complex sale occurs. And then, of course, you know, fast forward a couple of years later when marketing automation technology started to really mature the likes of your Marketos and your HubSpots and you name whatever the tool is today that's evolving even as we speak, that content became all of a sudden much more important. And also the dawn of social media added to that as well. But here we are today. And what I've found over the past you know three, four years is that there's this growing gap between all that content we're shoving into the marketplace, even if it's great quality, uh, that drives people to visit us, to convert, and do all those great things that we love as marketers. But there's this gap between that content and then the, the, the effort of our sales force. And whether you are a SaaS inside sales guy or gal just looking to gain subscriptions or, or subscriptions and lower churn rates, or you're a global enterprise-wide salesperson, you always have work to do on the front end of your sales funnel and you prospect and you get them in there and then you move them along to the close. There's a gap between where our marketing feeds maybe those leads or activities versus the prospecting that still happens there. And I you know, firmly believe, because I've seen it work, that we could fill that gap with a intelligent way of telling our story, not from our perspective, of course, and that you would think that's kind of table stakes, but you'd be surprised how many people look at the story of their customers through their own filter, but through this filter of those that we're seeking to serve. And now I, I believe in story wholeheartedly, of course, as you know, and I think from talking to a lot of folks like you on the show and seeing it in action, you know, people are always proclaiming content as king. And I think if that's the case, then I believe that storytelling is the kingdom sorcerer because it's really where the magic happens. It's just not just enough to have good content. It has to be content that connects. So 
Have you always been a storytelling disciple or where did you learn about it? Or when was the first time you saw it in action in your SaaS sales, yeah. technology sales, and you went, whoa, check that well, out. What yeah, just happened? I can remember, I, I tell you what, Parra, I get excited about talking about it because I can remember it as if it were yesterday. I was working for a software company and we had a big annual user event every year. And at the time I was, I was kind of running uh, product management and product marketing for one of our product lines. Uh, and we, the event held like probably about 5,000 people, but we broke into our separate product lines and I had about 1500 people in front of me and it was really, it was a user's conference. So these were our customers already. And they're always eager at this time of year to hear, Hey, is that one new feature or function that they've been dying for? Is it going to be in this upcoming release? So part after the keynote, so the, the event would open and we usually had a hired keynote that would come in and this particular year it was a. I forget the guy's name, to tell you the truth, but he was an astronaut who spent a year in the space station. So that was the keynote address. And afterwards, we broke up into our our product line segments, and I ran the one. So I got before the crowd, and I was very well rehearsed. Me and, and the um, the woman that was in charge of design, she was kind of operating the, the keyboard so they would see the functionality on the screen as I spoke about it. So we were very well, well rehearsed. We knew all the features we had to get to. We knew... Um, the timing, we knew how long we were going to take. But I don't know, honest to God, Park, I look back on that, and maybe it was my level of preparation, I don't know, but I had been inspired by this gentleman's um, talk, and I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to be a little bit more you know, narrative. I'm going to you know, be a little looser in this conversation and make people kind of get connected to what we're talking about. So what I began to do is I, I began to immediately recall all of the work that went into creating these features and functions. So we had done a lot of customer outreach and we had customer panels and I visited quite a number of customers to see them in their natural habitat, if you will. So I could see they were actually using the bits and bytes that we had put together. So I started to recall those little anecdotes and shared the features and the functions in the context of those anecdotes. And I knew, for instance, that one of the key features that they were all clamoring for, it wasn't, a, for us, it wasn't a big piece of functionality. It wasn't the most complex code that we put into the tool, but it was a convenience thing that people loved. And I knew they loved it, right? I knew they were going to love this release. And it was kind of a stuffy crowd. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're your typical kind of uh, engineer types of engineering type of software. So they weren't the most animated crowd. So when we got to this point, I knew that they were going to like this feature. So what I did is I told them the story of why that little annoyance that they've been waiting for years is finally going to be solved. And I encouraged them to show their appreciation for it. And I got to tell you, the whole presentation went that way where people were clapping and laughing and cheering about the new functionality. It was the most engaged software walkthrough that I'd ever done in my life. And Park, I got to tell you, at that moment, I knew walking away. And I, look, here's another thing too. After the, after the talk was over, I had a line about 20 deep wanting to talk to me about this, that, or the other thing, how they can get on the customer panels. They wanted to share their experience, why this new piece of functionality was going to help them get home to their kids more early at night or whatever it might be. And I was blown away by it, right? Because I didn't really do anything different. I just injected a little bit of color and narrative into the dis dissertation of these features and the functions. So well, I, yeah, I, I, think, looked, I think you did a lot different, honestly, because features and functions, you said it right there, we are programmed in default to selling features and functions, bulleted lists off of back of sales mm. sheets and brochures that said, look at rationally, you should buy our product because we're the biggest, bad, baddest, best, whatever. <laughs> um, and yet our brains sit there and they say, tell me a story, show it to me in action. Yes. Tell me about someone that you helped overcome something with what you make, because the stories, you know, Joel, as you know, is better as you know, better than anybody out there. It's not they're not about what you make, but what you make happen. And you just basically ignited your innate storyteller. I mean, well, that's what I love about this particular story. Is here this astronaut is up there, so is already living a pretty epic journey in his <laughs> own right, and he's you know plunked up there in the space in the in, in the uh, space station for a year. So he must have some really remarkable tales about that. You're out in this crowd. You are so well rehearsed. You've got the features and functions down cold. You even have your timing down cold. So you are like, literally, you are like a fine jazz pianist that has the chart in front of you completely memorized. You have your chops down. You have your muscle memory totally dialed in. 
And then that astronaut ignited within you that one true superpower that we all possess, that storyteller, that storyteller that was at the top of our game in kindergarten. And you're like, whoa, there's another way of sharing these features and functions. And all I need to do is share a few anecdotes and moments and some aha experiences that our customers have had using this. And then share real stories well told about what you make happen in their life. I mean, that's what that's what just struck me there in your tale. Yeah, you know, one of the things I remember probably most vividly is that the astronaut told the story. He had been in the space station for about a year, right? So when he, you come back, you know, your your muscles are not, you know, used to the gravity of Earth. So he told he told this very dramatic tale towards the end that he was not going to be wheeled out of the capsule when he came off. He was going to walk, right? So he gets down there and he's on the gurney and he tries to get up, but he's slowly walking to where he needs to go. And and like a slow clap began by all the people that were watching him, all the people that were helping him. And he kind of was very dramatic, right? So at the end of this presentation or the beginning, uh, what he said, what he said to his uh, partner, uh, he said, "Look, I'm not, I'm not going to walk. I'm not going to lay down. I'm not going to leave until I'm, I'm up on my feet and I'm walking to the uh, to the doctor." So I told uh, the audience because they had, remember they had just come from this keynote. I told the audience, I said, now look, I really want your enthusiasm when you see something you like. Because I told Eileen, the woman that was operating the keyboard, that I'm not leaving this podium until you know I get like a recognition. So I kind of tied it to his his uh, coming off the capsule. Well, it got a big laugh and it set the mood. And I think that's an important part of story is is connecting to things that are immediately familiar with your intended audience, right? Whether it was that moment that they had just come from a keynote or whether you know that, you know, they've all come from some thing or some common background and you know this element of story is going to connect with them. We needed to tap it and find those things to use them. You know, it's such a great point, and that requires simply awareness that we have to be sitting there and keeping our eyes open for the opportunities. Um, A couple weeks ago, I had a documentary filmmaker, a friend of mine, Peter Bick, on the show on Business of Story, and he talked about serendipity and how important it is in the creation of documentaries, because he said, you have to be paying attention. You never know when that interview is just going to pop up. Or just that right thing is going to happen and you have to be uh, rolling film tape. Otherwise, nobody will ever see it. So I apply that same sort of thinking to what you just talked about there. I call it designed serendipity. Designed because you're in the room and designed because you're paying attention. And then watch what unfolds. Watch the uniqueness of life unfold before you. And you it sounds like you did a brilliant job of connecting that keynote astronaut moment into your speech. So just like you said, you know, you're taking something that is immediately familiar and then connecting it to the content that is completely ingrained with you, but you do that through the power of storytelling. Yeah. No, listen, I, 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 it changed my, it changed my career trajectory, quite frankly, because I was so, first of all, what I, here's one thing, and I'm interested to hear what you think about this park is that it, it's just something that I'm able to do. Right. So one thing I always do when I'm, I'm talking to new, uh, would be customers. I, I asked them to give me a, a movie, just pick a movie out of the out of the air. And I try to explain to them the way a story arc works really quickly by just whatever movie they I could tell them what the status quo, the conflict and the resolution is in whatever movie they, they've picked, right? And at that moment, now I've I've always assumed that people are predisposed this way. And I think they're predisposed to to think and hear and learn and recall in that way. But what I found that day and then as my career kind of progressed from that point was that it's really not, it's really a unique skill set, something that I'm thankful that I possess and can help people with. I think people get tapped into it, but I don't think it becomes natural. I don't think it's a natural thing that people could just turn on or off. I think they have to, just like playing the piano, you know, I think everybody can kind of learn to play the piano, but you, you can't play it unless you're taught where the keys are and how to read music and tempo and things like that. Well, and like Stephen King, the great writer, says, if you want to become a better writer, do it every day for an hour and you will grow that riding muscle, just like lifting weights. And it's interesting, too, because we are so versed in story and storytelling. I still have to be very intentional about sitting down, designing, and mapping out the story that I'm going to tell. Otherwise, I end up doing and, 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 and boring our audiences. And in fact, my good buddy, Dr. Randy Olson, who wrote Houston, we have a narrative to keep it within the, the space theme here. Um, he was on our show talking about Donald Trump's narrative intuition. We recorded the show the day after the election. 
And he was talking about Donald Trump, Donald Trump's amazing narrative intuition of just about you know, what you talked about too. set up conflict resolution. America used to be great. America is no longer great. I'm going to make America great again. Yeah. As basal as that is, that truly resonates in people's minds. Um, so in saying all that, Randy's working on a documentary right now, a short one, a 20 minute piece about the ABT, you know, just that three act structure. And he's been editing it and sending it out. We've looked at roughs and whatever. And he uh -huh. was sort of giggling when he sent me an email over the weekend that said, this just wasn't working for me. And I couldn't figure out why until my friend Rick shows up and says, Randy, you're not even using story structure in it. And so he hits himself up in the head, upside the head. And I laughed about it because it does not matter how studied you are or how practiced you are in it. You have to be very intentional about telling stories and make sure that you get it into your presentations or your content marketing or whatever it is. Yeah. But start with a moment. Start with a human experience around your product or service. Tell a story, as you said, beginning, middle, end, set up problem resolution. Well, however you want to do that, you can be short, concise, specific, to the point. But for God's sake, give us a story to wrap our, our, our minds around the context of what it is you're trying to sell me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I'm I'm a big fan of storyboarding things. It's I have a I have a, a number of children, and one of my uh, children is in the Cub Scouts, and right now, and they're towards he's almost a Boy Scouts, and they're learning. They're really trying to teach. There's certain there's about 13, 15 laws of what a scout is, and one of the uh, badges that you're supposed to earn is this movie making. So I thought, you know what, we're going to do. We're gonna I'm gonna really work to embed in these children's minds what these these words are things like trustworthiness loyalty things like that so what we did was i had them i taught them and the badge of story uh i'm sorry movie making right so what we did on this particular meeting is i had the boys break into groups of two and i taught them how to storyboard i'm like okay here's what you're gonna do you're gonna pick a word out of the hat one of the laws loyalty let's say and you you can make it as funny as you want dramatic whatever you want but you're going to map out like a three block box and the first one is hey what's going on the middle one is hey what what happens where it where there's some some big event that causes you to figure out what this term is that you've picked out of the hat and then how do you demonstrate that you've got it so i want you to draw it in stick figures we're going to take snaps of that and then i had a little tripod with my phone and we we had them make little movies of each of their words right and you know what? It was, it worked. I was a little nervous, great, because they're like 10 year old kids, right? <laughs> 10 year old boys. So you never know if I'm going to hold control of the room. But I have to tell you, like, they, they might not know all those words as intimately as, the, but they, the ones they do know are the ones they own that night, them and their partner, because they had the storyboard down. They all drew their stick figures, they rehearsed it, and then they demonstrated it in front of the camera. We made little vignettes and movies out of it. So that's, look, if I could teach a bunch of 10 year old kids to do that and they walk away intimately knowing loyalty or trustworthiness or whatever it was because they performed it in front of a camera and they storyboarded that out first, well, then surely something much more complex and important as what we do for a living uh, can be aligned that way. Well, I love hearing that story because we do something exactly the same. I was going to say very similar, but no, it's actually exactly the same when we're working on brand story strategy for a client. I'll ask them, and for those of you, you know, scoring at home, you can do this after the show. Try that. Check this out. So what I ask them to do, Joel, is come up with nine descriptors of your brand. And, you know, it could be loyalty. I hear innovation a lot, honesty, fun, integrity, uh, forward thinking, these sorts of things. So, you know, descriptors, adjectives, whatever. And then I asked the group, I said, take one story or one word, each of you get a different word and then reflect back within your organization and describe a story. Tell us a story that underscores that word. So say it's innovation. And Sally, you know, says, oh, I remember two years ago when we were on the product development team and such and such happened, we designed this beautiful new innovation. But this whole thing blew up when we took it to market and we realized that we needed to pivot by six degrees on this one little thing and we did it and it took, you know, it, and then to get the conflict, grow the conflict. It took us longer than expected. We overspent just a little bit, but when we took it back to the market, our clients loved it and we, you know, achieved 120% sales uh, in the first year. That's what innovation is about. We never stop 
innovation until we get that exact product. And so I asked them to do the exact same thing you have your Boy Scouts did, do the 10 year olds out there. And it is really powerful because I think that one word snaps the brain to attention. You have to have a theme, a focus theme for every story. And then just as you did, you take them through the three acts. Okay. In, you know, three basic chunks, tell us the story, set it up, give us then the action, the, you know, the conflict or whatever, give us great action in the middle of it. And then the resolution of how our people won out because of it. And our theme here in this case is innovation or in your case, loyalty. So I have found that works really, really well when people are trying to uncover the stories inside their brands to support their new brand or refresh brand yeah. story, but yeah. they see it in action that way. Just like you did in your presentation, you, you, you shared stories that demonstrated the action in people's lives that your you know, products make happen. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, what? as you're, you're talking there, Park, I, one of the things that it does also is it helps uncover the reality of like, listen, everybody's got value statements and they are, they adorn the walls of our offices, but I, I can't tell you how many times I'll walk into one of my clients that have their values printed somewhere, but no one can quite clearly articulate or identify what they actually mean. And when you deep dive them the way you just described there, sometimes it's a, it's a, they're fearful of the exercise because they might find out that this particular value, this cultural importance that they thought was so ingrained in their DNA really doesn't exist and really isn't a part of their culture and really doesn't represent who they are. So I, I sometimes I think that people are fearful to dig down a little bit deeper because they'll find that word that they were so connected to really doesn't represent them or doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, so that's I, I don't think that people should be fearful of that, however, because when we're able to dive into what the words actually mean and, and are they reflective of who we are and is it the language that we ought to be using and can it reinforce what our purpose and intent is to be in the marketplace and how we serve, we, we dive down and really find those things, then we're able to be more passionate about what we do. We're able to more clearly communicate it. We're able to put our customers first. So I really believe that above, above all, story is a catalyst to really great you know, things within our organizations. And I, I I hear what you're saying about those vision statements and those missions mission statements and the value statements. And what I equate those to is rote learning, which we all grew up on, which, by the way, silences our innate storyteller. It doesn't kill them. It silences it because rote is just memorization and it's really hard to memor memorize it. It's all in your head. It's not in your heart. What a brand story strategy does, and when you start using stories to help support your brand, you are now teaching your people by lore. Mm -hmm. And I would much rather learn by lore than by rote, because you are sharing real things that have happened that support the overall values, mission, and vision of your company by demonstrating it in action. And if you don't demonstrate it in action, then it's just a bunch of pretty words, lovely words that we have to memorize and <laughs> try to live into. Yeah. So when we come back, I want to take a quick break here for a couple of stories. But Joel, when we come back, can you give us some ideas of now um, after that big, awe-inspiring event where you really saw a story in action and you reignited your inner storyteller, what are you doing these days about it? And what can we learn from you how to become better and more intentional about the stories we tell in sales? So let's cover that right after this. The term content marketing has been around since Bill Gates coined it over, wait for it, wait for it, 20 years ago. Can you believe it's been that long? He published an article on January 3rd, 1996, titled Content is King. But content for content's sake isn't what keeps people coming back for more. If content is king, then it's story that is the kingdom sorcerer. It's where the magic happens. That's why I'm a big believer in evolving content marketing into story marketing. And by story marketing, I mean a strategic marketing approach that creates a brand experience through audio, visual, and immersive storytelling, whereby the customer becomes the center of the story to drive profitable engagement. And that's why on every show, I like to feature our story marketer of the week. And this week, perhaps, is the most obvious story marketer of all, at least to me, and that's Red Bull. Red Bull not only invented the energy drink category decades ago, they were one of the first to perfect story marketing by placing the exploits of their daredevils at the center of each and every one of their stories. Why? So we, the Freddy Cat customer, 
can live vicariously through their exploits. And best of all, Red Bull doesn't tell us stories of what they make, but what they make happen. Their story marketing, as well as their product, literally gives us wings. So take a deeper dive into Red Bull's story marketing odyssey on our site at businessofstory.com. Then go out, get your wingsuit on, jump off of El Capitan, and live a little, will you? can't thank you enough for listening to my Business of Story podcast. Your notes, tweets, and emails telling me how this program and our amazing guests have helped you live into a more powerful story make it all worthwhile. And yet, coming to you in audio only is the most one-dimensional way I can imagine to reignite within you the one true superpower we all possess, storytelling. So picture me with you live. That's right. I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the power of story marketing, and I'm ready to do this for you and your people. You can book me for keynotes and workshops, brand story strategy consulting, and live webinars. You can also join me for free every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time on Facebook Live. During my weekly show, I review the smart story marketers who are making an impact every day with their business storytelling. I take you through an element of the story cycle system that you can immediately apply to your brand story. And I offer up a free tool, tip, or technique that will help you clarify your brand story and rise above the noise of the attention economy. Just follow me on Facebook or join our private group called the Business of Story Raconteurs. We'd love to have you be a part of our story marketing family. So let me help you get your story on by visiting my speaker page at businessofstory.com and start crafting and telling compelling stories that sell. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Joel Caparella. By the way, you can track Joel down at Joel Caparella, that's C-A-P-P-E-R-E-L-L-A.com. On his website, he's got a lot of great tools there for you. And uh, before we tell them about your one content alignment tool, give us a little bit more background. Have you said that this experience changed your life? And it sounds like certainly changed your professional life. What are you doing now with Story? How are you teaching it to your clients? And what are some things you can share with us that we can do immediately after the show to become better at it? Sure. I, I, first of all, I, I, love, I love the opportunity to talk about it because I, I've seen the impact that it's had on on growth, uh, on our business objectives, but also people's lives, right? It helps people. I can't even articulate it quite clearly, just the the change in people when they actually are able to tap into the more dramatic narrative of what they do, no matter what it is, by the way. I think I think no matter what your profession, you could find the drama in any profession. So uh, I, I look, I'd love to be able to tell you that after that awesome event, that I, you know, <laughs> it, everything changed all at once, but that's not just not the case. It took a a little while for me to come to the point where I wanted to go out on my own and, and help people do this. So I traversed, you know, through my career and I ran marketing for a professional services firm for about five years. And this was probably 08. I started that 09 maybe. And it was also uh, coincided with social media really coming to the forefront. You know, you mentioned Donald Trump and what, what he had done with his story. Well, in 2008, another man, Barack Obama, same kind of thing. I mean, his story was very simple. You know, hope, hope. Was, see, he packed his story into a single word, right? Uh, and it made a dramatic impact. But he also leveraged media very interestingly at the time. And that really motivated me to dive because I think presidential politics is actually a pretty good marketing uh, exercise and case study if you take a, a good look at it because they care about your demographics. They care about the story and how it impacts those demographics. So it's a marketer's dream if you look at that data. But uh, it motivated me to figure out, okay, this is the media landscape. How is it going to change my job? So I started to test and, and experiment with things. I ended up bringing a marketing automation tool. I think it was HubSpot at the time uh, into the organization. And we, we began to make bets on inbound marketing and content marketing and it had dramatic impact to the sales force. Um, but what motivated me to, to step out on my own was that the – the 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 re, the reaction internally to my organization it was a very conservative type of group so I had to fight for a lot of changes that we were making and and doing things a lot differently. But and, and what industry was it in? You said professional services firm. What what kind of yeah, industry? Yeah, it was. was it uh, that's a good question. Well, it's, it's interesting because we were uh, it was 
it was staff augmentation and big IT projects, that kind of work. So sourcing out big, large IT teams to large companies. Interestingly, though, the parent company of, of um, we were about a $500 million pro serve firm, but the parent company was this two and a half billion dollar kind of conglomerate engineering firm, and they were a hundred years old. So they had a very uh, stoic, old, traditional kind of culture. And they had no digital footprint at all, except for their website, and they weren't doing any media work at all at the time. So it was it was kind of a you know talk about the conflict for me the status was the status quo was here's this hundred year old plus company the conflict was I wanted to do new things with media that were going to expose us a little bit more publicly to uh, to our marketplace and the resolution was we were actually able to do some really cool things really award winning things with what we did with our media there and um, by the way Joel I'll say you have just described another thing that has a way of silencing that inner storyteller so I mentioned early on we were at the tops of our storytelling games in kindergarten and our educational system teaching us by rote and drawing within the lines and sit down, be quiet, and stop telling stories, why it's that inner storyteller. And now, as you just identified there too, our corporate cultures do the exact mm. same thing. The older the company, the worse it is. Joel, we don't do it that way around here. Joel, we've been around for 100 plus years because we do it, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And there's no growth. There's no journey. There's no traversing of the story system. So again, you, you know, you can't blame people within these large organizations to go back to rote features and functions, communications, and miss the most powerful super uh, superpower they have, and that's storytelling. Yeah, so right. I see you, that you are experiencing this right there, too. Absolutely. And look, I, Park, I, this is why I love your show, because I could tell you're passionate about it, you believe in it, you help people tap into it. And I couldn't agree more, right? Because I think that because look, the fight that I led there, that's what motivated me to go out and do it on my own, because we had some great success. And, and people internally were drawn to it. I mean, we actually did this. My, one of my last things I did before I stepped out on my own is we did this like radical rebrand of the company. And it's funny because I look back on it now and they've actually kind of they kind of pulled the reins back in and aligned that brand that I launched in 2013 or 14 back to a little bit more conservative. But at the time, we pushed this very radical kind of idea into the marketplace of of what it meant to be in this marketplace. And people were, I mean, people were, ecstatic about it they were really jazzed up it changed they, they got motivated the, the the employee uh satisfaction engagement rates went up retention went down because people were engaged with what we did for other human beings right it wasn't just you know getting the project team going or making sure our margins are protected those things are all important but they don't have meaning right they have they have fiscal meaning but they don't have emotional human meaning so when we were able to do that it really then that's that's the spark it's like well shoot this is one segment I want to go out. I want to, this is what I want to do. I want to do it for as many companies as I can. I feel I'm kind of called to it, if you will, not to be too dramatic, but I feel it's my gift. I want to share share it with more people. And oh, by the way, I think I can make a good living doing it. So that's why I stepped out to, to go on my own, to help people tap into what you're calling our super strength, right? Which it absolutely is. Well, and you know, to quote Joseph Campbell, not to be too woo-woo, but I see it uh, I believe it a big time is when you follow your bliss, doors open where there were only walls before. So you had this aha moment uh, following the astronaut that you're like, wow, this works. And then you go in, you are literally thrown in the the uh, dungeon, thrown in the, uh, what, what does Campbell also say? Go in the cave where you fear to go most and there you'll find your treasure. Well, you were in that cave for five years in the professional services firm that's saying, Joel, we don't do it that way. You slayed that beast by coming out with a very empowering, um, gutsy, and I would probably say courageous brand story that then excited the employees, you said, because now they are really into this story because they are part of the story. They're right alongside you working with it. Um, and so there's no wonder when you see that kind of action. I mean, I've done that. I've experienced that where I've helped companies grow by three and 400% be simply because they wrote a more courageous, more interesting, more dynamic story than they than they were ever given themselves permission to do before. Sounds like you had the exact same experience. So now you're out on your own doing it for other companies. Mm, yeah. And I'll tell you, early on, one of the things I identified very early, um, and I kind of inherently knew it, but now you're on your own. Now you have to, you have to you know, make some money doing this, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that Listen, we're so saturated with all the tips, tricks, and hacks that you need to do to fill up your marketing funnel and drive it to some kind of level of conversion. 
but if you look at a lot of the reports coming back on the sales side of that equation, especially in you know, the transactional sales, is a little bit different. I don't, I don't really do a lot of uh, you know shopping cart type stuff. That's just not my my expertise. But on a sale that's a little bit more nuanced and complex, you know, people are going to at least need to have a couple conversations before they make a decision or sign up or subscribe. Uh, there's there's a gap between the marketing what people call in the in the marketing industry the marketing qualified lead. Uh, as it applies to now a sales qualified lead. And that conversion rate is something marketers always chase down is they want to get a high MQL to SQL ratio. But what I found firsthand, and, and a lot of the reports lately support this, is that even with the highest and best MQL to SQL ratio, salespeople are prospecting on their own 75, 80% of the time before they even will consider a lead coming from marketing. And now, so, and what does that, where does that leave us? You know, marketing's got this great engine. They've got an awesome demand generation uh, process. They're able to build content that attracts people, converts them, keeps them coming back. And they're able to qualify in some internal, uh, you know, criteria that allows us to hand it over to sales. But what's it, what happens when it gets to sales? Sales still has to figure out and prospect, are they real? And, and look, any good sales manager in the world will tell you that they don't want it in their sales pipeline unless it's worth hunting. I mean, it, and they'll tell you that. I mean, if you ask a sales manager, you know, what should be in the early stage of the sales pipeline? Well, I don't want them in their pipeline unless it meets this, that, and the other criteria. So again, this wasn't necessarily news to me, but what I discovered is, listen, a lot of our content is so focused on the marketing funnel, and that's all good. I'm not saying it's not important, it is but it doesn't extrapolate over to actually helping the salesperson out. And I think it's easily achieved, right? If we help the salesperson understand that creative arc of where they are in connecting and engaging with their with their would-be customer, uh, and then we help them align up all the content that does exist, make it their own, like turn them into little story factories as well, uh, it helps them prospect more swiftly. It helps them use content to their benefit. Even if the lead didn't come from marketing, they'll be able to prospect more intelligently. They'll get more engaged. They'll they'll be able to listen with a different set of ears. They'll be more uh, related, if you will, to their customer, and it helps them. So, Joel, let me ask you right there, stop you for a second and say, so this isn't about telling a story. This is about appreciating the journey, the story journey that your customer currently is on and where they are within their own story. Even, I suppose, having the appreciation for the stories they are telling themselves about their own needs and about how you might be able to succeed, you know, help them get that before you tell them your story. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think you've nailed it, right? I think it's, listen, and, and here's where marketing really should play the biggest role is sometimes, look, if we have trouble telling our own story or our customer stories, we have to assume that our customers probably have difficulty telling their own, right? So this is where marketing can really play the most impactful role is let's help them understand what their story actually is and why these things matter. Because what you're going to find is, you know, 95% of the time, they might not even know what that story is. And here's where marketing can set the perspective. Now, here's how you should consider this, whatever this thing is, because it impacts you in this way and you care about it, right? And I need to know you well enough to know that you care about it. So I can enable my salespeople to be the um, stewards, if you will, of the customer story to help them, to help them allow the customer to tap in, engage and connect with what their story truly is, if that makes sense. And how do you do that? If you're sitting across the table from a salesperson and say, oh, Joel, that's all well and good. And I've heard this a ton of times too. Story, it's all the rage, but it's kind of a gimmick, isn't it? How do you counteract that anti-story to using yeah. stories to fill the sales funnel? Well, I, I, it's it's a good question, and it's never easy because sales, look, the sales uh, creature is, and look, it's funny because I, I spent marketing, I was in marketing most of my career on my own for a couple of years now. I'm both the sales guy and the marketer, and I have such a deeper appreciation for what salespeople uh, do because now I'm doing it myself. And I don't, I think if more marketers understood the, the story of the salesperson, because think about it, the salesperson in the organization, they're probably the only, everyone's, everyone's to say, oh, I, I treat my work with an entrepreneurial spirit. And that's all well and good, but the salesperson is probably the only one in the organization that actually treats their work as an entrepreneurial effort because they don't get paid unless they hit their quota, right? So they're very entrepreneurial in nature. So for, for the, the salesperson, I think we have to help them. I, I don't think you can 
dictate. I don't think we can say, hey, here's the here's the script to follow. I think we have to help make help them make the connection to, hey, here's what your customers do care about. Here's one of the you know, three to five hooks that you're going to get them on the line with. We know that because that's what we do for marketing. And oh, by the way, here's some of the uh, here's some of the, the trajectories that this conversation can go. You, by the way, you can't do this as a marketer unless you are listening in on their sales calls. So, for instance, that's one of the things I always tell my clients. First thing I do when I'm engaged with them, if they have an inside sales team or they have more than three people that are on the phones or or even out visiting a customer. I said, listen, can we either have those calls recorded or can I sit on one? Can I go on a sales visit? Because I don't need to talk to the marketers. Most of the time, the marketers know who their persona is. They, their demand engine's working very well. They're, they're excellent at tactical campaign execution. That's not where they need help. But I can listen to the salesperson and they start to, be, I to begin to immediately tap into the dramatic nature of what's happening here. And then what we do is we go back and look at the inventory of everything they produced and say, okay, you got some great content here. It's at the marketing level. Let's bring it down a couple notches to connect it to those dramatic elements of the cadence of the sales conversation. So, Joel, just to clarify something, you just said uh, tap into the dr- the dramatic nature of what's happening here. What do you mean by that? Uh, I'll give you a great example. Um, I have a client on the hook right now. Hopefully, I'll close this one by the time uh, this airs. Uh, but they're a large organization large enterprise software company and they have an awesome campaign engine okay uh, they, they're they have great they have a phenomenal demand generation engine and but they have that common problem where the salespeople are prospecting on their own they're turning to these awesome inbound leads 20 mm, percent of the time max so better than most but still not enough so but one thing that if you look at the marketing content it's all kind of glossy you know what i mean it's highly produced it's not mm-hmm. uh, there's it it speaks as if you know what it's it's like if you bought a travel book park from somebody that's only researched the city that you're going to but never actually went there uh it might be accurate it might be representative of where you're headed but there's going to be something missing right mm-hmm. so that is what i'm helping them uh tap into is when I'm, so when I talk about the dramatic nature of what's happening in the sales conversation is people buy for a reason, right? They're not looking to just plunk their money down because the sales guy was a good person, right? They have some issue. And we all know the pain solution game, right? But that's not necessarily it. What is that? What What's the why, right? I always drive people to the why and always continuously asking why until I get far enough away from the pain solution equation, which we all know, to see what's the human equation, what's the drama, Right. So, for instance, um, you know, why is, you know, they, they're, the big push for this company is to move them off of a legacy onto their cloud. Okay, if that's the case, why do you want to do that? Well, the company wants to do it because I want people on our new offering. Okay, great, but not for the customer. Why should we, the customer do it? Well, they want to do it because they want these new features. They can only get them on the cloud. Okay, why do they want these new features? Well, they want these new features because their competitor is able to drive them down in margin by whatever percent. Okay, so why again? Well, that that difference in margin is going to prevent them from bidding on this big job that's right up their alley. Okay, and, and you continue going on there, and what you might find out is that big job that they can't bid against might make or break who they are. Put people out of out of uh, might have to have twenty percent of the staff laid off. If you look at the staff that's going to be laid off, then there's you know a, a, a single mother in there with three children that is needs the income and she's really good at her job, but she would be the first one on the chopping block, right? So that's, there's the drama. That's why it exists. And if you think, if you're a salesperson and you don't think all of that is in the mind of your prospect, you're wrong because it absolutely is. It makes them who they are. It, it sends them home happier or a little frustrated at night, whichever direction. Because look, I mean, we're human beings and what happens in our daily uh day to day has an impact on who we are outside of the, outside of the uh, walls of the office. So if we understand that, that drama exists in the minds and the spirit of who we're selling to, we do a lot better. It's so interesting. You're getting people out of their intellectual, you know, left brain, quote unquote, by asking them that I think that's the old six Sigma trick, isn't it? The five whys to a root cause as you keep doing, well, why, but you know, why, why, yeah, why, yeah. until you get down to you're unpacking this intellectual approach down to the humanity, the dramatic, uh, the drama that's wedding, what's happening in these folks' lives, turning data into drama, and it's the drama that we care about. That's, that's what's so interesting. It's a really great technique to do. So you go in there, and if you're working with a client or a customer and you're seeing you know, they've got their features and functions all over the place, 
it sounds like you can just take them through that five whys. Just keep asking why, why, why until you reduce it down to what is the human impact that's going on? What is the human yes. motivation? Why are they doing it? And then wrapping a story around that or finding the stories that are actually happening and sharing yeah. the stories around that, I guess. No, absolutely, Parker. I think customer advocacy, I think, is the best place for the salesperson to start to dive into this. Because if you look at most customer advocacy or reference uh, videos or whatnot, it's all about, oh, the company that we do business with is great. And they helped us do this, they helped us do that. But it never gets down to like the emotional element of what's really happening. I think that's a that's some place that you could start immediately is get your customers on video talking about not you or what you did for them or how great their life is now, but just what that journey has been like. And I think you you start to find a lot of a lot of uh, nuggets in there that really help you embed that story into the process. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've got a tool on your site. Tell us a little bit about that and uh, how can we use it to align our content and our stories to be able to fill our sales funnel, as you say, with people worth storying with, <laughs> you know, yes. potentials that are worth our time and effort. Yeah, no, listen, it's uh, it's called a content alignment review and they could find it. I'm sure you'll put the link up, but it's uh, the short, my, my, I have a long Italian last name. So I have a URL, Joel Cap is a lot easier, dot com. And it's forward slash content alignment review with dashes between all those words. So joelcap.com content alignment review. And what it does is it allows you to submit your content footprint. I ask you, you have to fill out a form of about five or six questions. And then I'll take a look at your earned media, uh, things that you've earned through uh, PR work. I'll take a look at your owned media, things that you've developed internally. And uh, I come back and say, okay, and uh, ideally you'll give me your personas if you have them defined. And I'll come back and I'll let you know, okay, here's where your content is on the story matrix. I have a story matrix where the Y axis is the level of prescription you're offering to the marketplace. And the X axis is the level of drama that you're ejecting into your content. So I'll show you where you are on those four quadrants of the story matrix. I'll show you where your content from an objective perspective is speaking to your marketing funnel, how sales enabled it is. And I'll tell you what's working with your content. Hey, here's some really good things. Do more of this. And hey, here's two or three things you can do to make it even better. So it, the idea of it is to get a fresh look at your content footprint, uh, your story footprint, and then get some immediate actionable things you could do right away that are going to help you improve it. So you are introducing the content king to the kingdom sorcerer. Is that what I'm hearing you say? To bring a little <laughs> magic right. to your communication uh, out there. I like that. I like that. Maybe I'll, re I'll call it uh, the content wizard or something like that. I like that. <laughs> Only if I get a byline. That's all I ask. <laughs> you got, you got it. <laughs> well, Joel, I really appreciate you being here on Business of Story. Can you share uh, one final thought with our listeners? What's one, two, or three things that we can all be doing right now to get more intentional about infusing story into our sales. This is going to sound a little odd, but um, I'm going to put it out there anyway because I'm a big believer in it. I am a Gary Vaynerchuk fan. For those of you that don't know him, look him up. He's he's an interesting character. He's not for everybody. His style is not for everybody. But what he's absolutely awesome at is he tells story continuously and he leverages it over every platform of media that's out there. Now, when you first tap into him and see, and see what he's all about, he talks to like this entrepreneurial world is all about hustle culture and things like that. So you kind of have to set that aside if you're not into that. And you have to see, and I would especially point you to his daily vlog, which is called the Daily V. He, he kind of journeys, does a video blog of his day to day of what he's got going on, but he always injects elements of the culture of his organization. He runs a media company in New York called Vayner Media. He uh, profiles people that come to work for him. He makes it clear what's important to his company. He makes, uh, so he's constantly telling the story of who he is as an entrepreneur and as a very successful businessman. He's constantly telling the story of how to leverage media. He's constantly telling the story of what's important to his uh, culture of his, of his employees what he values it is i think the man manages media better than anyone out there and you could if you just even pull one example away from that so now what's the application start doing something even if it's only internal like start documenting something internally that's important to you and you're going to discover so much of the hidden drama that you didn't even know existed for your organization that's amazing yeah he he is good i saw him speaking at social media marketing world last year and uh it, it was a really fun very vibrant uh, presentation. <laughs> so if you don't mind an F-bomb here or there, yeah. uh, you can really d dissect, unpack a lot of great storytelling information out of him. Uh, well, thank you, Joel. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you for your persistence to get on our show. It's 
just been an absolute pleasure. We were able to cover story in kind of a different way. I mean, you are about our, what, 90th show, I believe. And this is the first time we've really looked at how to use story to fill up that sales funnel with the right people, not just an audience of who cares, but the, an audience that's actually going to make a difference to your business. So thank you for that. Anywhere else we want to send people to learn a little bit more about you and what you do? Uh, joelcap.com is the best place to go. And uh, you can always reach me on Twitter. I'm Joel Caparello on Twitter. Just let me know you would heard the show. I'll be happy to chat with you. Right on. Well, thank you, Joel, for being here. We really appreciate it. Mark, thank you. And thank you for the show. It's, it's really great. I love it. I appreciate it. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. You know what to do next. Sit down, start getting more intentional about your storytelling. And if I can help you, just visit me over at businessofstory.com. If you've got an idea for a guest or would like to be on the show, shoot me a note at park at businessofstory.com. And then, of course, join me next Monday when we'll bring you another amazing story artist like Joel that will help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And until then, have a wonderful life. Wonderful life.